Okay, everybody, good morning. Today we will talk about the appendicular skeleton. You know that the skeleton has two parts axial skeleton or axial part and appendicular skeleton or appendicular part. Appendicular skeleton includes the upper and lower extremities. So these two are upper extremities and these two are lower extremities. Okay? Now both upper and lower extremities have girdles. So first we will talk about the girdles. For upper extremities you have two pectoral girdles and for lower extremity you have only one pelvic <coughs> girdle. Okay? So those are the girdles. <coughs> you see here this is one pectoral girdle and this is the other pectoral girdle. Okay? So two pectoral girdles. The pectoral girdle is formed by two bones, clavicle in the front and scapula in the back. Okay? These two bones join here at acromioclavicular joint and form the pectoral girdle. Is it clear? Why this is called acromioclavicular joint? Because this is the acromion of the scapula. Okay? And this is clavicle. That's why it is called acromio. Clavicular joint. Okay, so this is the pectoral girdle. Now, pelvic girdle is formed by two hip bones. You see, this is one hip bone or pelvic bone. This is another hip or pelvic bone, right? So these two pelvic bones together form the pelvic girdle, and they join here at pubic symphysis. You see the fibrocartilaginous structure here. This is called pubis symphysis. So two hip bones or pelvic bones joined to form pelvic girdle. Now functions of these girdles. What they do? You see the pectoral girdle connects the upper limb bones. These are the upper limb bones, right? To the axial skeleton. This is the axial skeleton, you know. So, connecting the upper limb bones to the axial skeleton is one function of the pectoral girdle. Another is securing the upper limbs. Secures the upper limb. And pelvic girdle, you see here, pelvic girdle has more functions. First, same function as pectoral, connecting the lower limb bones to the axial skeleton, right? So connecting the lower limb bones to the axial skeleton. Another function, and by doing that, it secures the lower limb bones. Then another function of pelvic girdle is transmitting the weight, body weight. You see here, we know that most of the body weight is transmitted through the vertebral column, right? So, you see here, vertebral column is attached to the hip bones. So, from the vertebral column, the body weight is transmitted transmitted to the pelvic girdle and then go to the legs. Make sense? So, transmitting the body weight from the body to the leg, from the trunk to the upper part of the body to the leg. Make sense? So, that is another function. And number three is 
protecting the pelvic organs. You know this is the pelvic cavity. You remember that? Thoracic cavity, abdominal cavity, pelvic cavity. So pelvic organs, very important organs like your uterus when the fetus is inside, right? Embryo is inside, very important, should be protected. So those organs are protected by the pelvic garden. Make sense? These bones are protecting these organs. So what are the important functions of the pelvic girdle? I mentioned one is attaching the lower limb bones to the axial skeleton, right? Number two, transmitting the body weight to the legs. Is it clear? Number three, protecting the pelvic organs. Okay? So those are the girdles. Now uh, Girdle consists of the clavicle and scapula. First, we'll talk about the clavicle. Clavicle is also known as collarbone. In female, sometimes we we'll say beauty bone. Okay, so we'll see uh, uh, celebrity. They want to show this beauty bone. Okay, so collarbone or beauty bone. This is a long bone which is placed horizontally like this. You see other long bones, most of the long bones are vertically, right? Like this. But this one is placed horizontally. This bone has two ends. You already know this is the sternal end because it is attached to the sternum. So this end is called what? Sternal end. Make sense? And this end is called acromial end because attached to the acromion of the scapula, right? Forms the acromial clavicular joint here. So two ends, sternal and acromial. Clear? Now you see another thing, if I divide this bone into medial <coughs> two-third and lateral one-third. This is medial two-third, this is lateral one-third. Medial two-third is round forward like this and lateral one-third is concave forward. So this is round but convex, medial two-third and lateral one-third is concave. Okay. <clears throat> Fracture of clavicle is common. If someone falls this way to the ground, okay? You see here, these ribs are slightly behind them, the clavicle, right? So that hit some, you know, uh, hit first is taken by this one. So the fracture usually or often occurs in the clavicle. Scapula. Scapula is also known as shoulder blade. Shoulder blade. But if somebody asks you, don't say shoulder blade, okay? <laughs> it's a common term. Common people will say that. You are learning anatomy, right? So you should start to use Medical term in the world. Okay? So don't say collarbone, say clavicle, don't say shoulder blade, say scapula. Okay? Start, start to use those. So scapula has a cavity or fossa that is called glenoid cavity that holds the head of the humerus. This is the head of the humerus and this is the glenoid cavity. Make sense? So, the head of the humerus fits in the glenoid cavity at the shoulder joint. And this is the shoulder joint, head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity. Now, see one thing. This glenoid cavity is not very deep. If you look at this, it is shallow, right? It is not deep, not like this, it is shallow. And head of the humerus goes there. 
since the glenoid cavity is very shallow, the head is not strongly held there. Is it clear? So the head of the humerus can easily comes off, and that happens. Okay, and that is called what? Dislocation. dislocation. Shoulder dislocation. That's why it happens often. Because of the shallowness of the glenoid cavity or fossa. We actually had a question about that. Because you said that if it breaks, it's most likely to break at the start of the line. Yeah. But isn't it, is it more likely to be dislocated than it is to break? Yes, yes. Uh, it depends which way you, you know, hit the bone. If you hit from the top, most likely dislocation will occur. Or from the bottom, dislocation will occur. Okay. It falls, you know, this way sideways hits something sideways, it fracture will pop right here. So, uh, of course, the most important thing is which way the shock is coming, from which direction, okay? So that is important. But yes, shoulder dislocation is pretty, you know, common in sports, certain sports, right? Yeah, you will see that happens. So if that happens, uh, you can do what? You can push the head back into the cavity, right? Uh, but uh, that's the, that's the uh, thing you will do, but don't do it yourself. Uh, then the person may get angry and sue it. <laughs> 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 but this is just, it should go back. To this, right to okay. okay, so that's the glenoid cavity. Now, in the back of the scapula, you see a structure bony structure comes out from the back. And this part is called the spine of the scapula. So in the back, you have a spine. Make sense? And this spine divides the dorsal surface or back of the scapula into supraspinous and infraspinous fossa. <coughs> very, very simple. Above the spine is what? Supraspinous, Supra right? And below the spine, infraspinous. Okay? So supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa. In the front, this is the front. Let me show you the back. That is the back. So you see the spine, right? Spine in the back and supraspinous fossa above it, infraspinous fossa below. The front of the scapula or the anterior surface of the scapula has no structure. It's just, you know, slightly curved like this and that entire surface is called subscapular fossa. So three fossa. The entire anterior surface is subscapular fossa and in the back you have supraspinous and infraspinous fossa. Make sense? So three fossa. Now you see here. This spine, this is the spine, it continues and turns like this. And this part, the end part, is called acromion. Make sense? And that part articulates with the clavicle, right? To form acromioclavicular joint. Make sense? Okay, good. So this is what? Spine. Spine. And this part? Acromion. Acromion. And this joint? Acromion. Clavicular. Clavicular, right? Joint. Okay. <coughs> then you have another structure here. This is called coracoid process. Coracoid process. The term coracoid came from the beak of the bar. You know the beak of the bar? So it looks like that. I don't know if it does, but the person named it thought that it, it looks like a beak of bar. So coracoid process. Okay? Now the last thing you see here, in the superior border or margin, there is a notch. Notch is U-shaped area, right, in a board. I mentioned it before. So you see a tiny U-shaped structure here. That is called suprascapular notch. Supra means top, above. So a notch on the superior border, that is called suprascapular notch. 
So those are the parts of a scapula. Is it clear? Okay. So those are two bones that form the pectoral girdle. <clears throat> now we'll see the bones of the upper limb. This is the upper limb. In your arm, you have the longest bone of <coughs> upper limb, not the longest bone of the body. Longest bone of the body is the femur. Okay? So this is the humerus, which is the longest bone of the upper limb and located in the arm, arm bone. Then you have two forearm bones. The, this is the anatomical position, you know that, right? So this is lateral. So thumb side one is called radius, the lateral one, and medial one is called ulna. Okay? So radius and ulna. You see, this is lateral thumb, radius, this is ulna. Okay? Then you have the wrist bones here. There are eight cubical shaped small bones in the wrist. How many? Eight. eight. They form two <coughs> rows, four in each. So this is proximal row, this is distal row. Four, four. Eight small, short, cubical shaped bones. Those are called carpals. And then you have the bones of your palm here. Five. One, two, three, four, five. These are called metacarpals. Okay, this is number one, just under the thumb. Number one, two, three, four, five. That's how we count. Start from the thumb side, okay? <coughs> one, two, three, four, five. So five. One, two, three, four, five. Metacarpals. Make sense? And then you have the finger bones. Phalanges. <coughs> How many? 14. Why 14? Each of these four has three. So 12, right? 3, 3, 3, 3, 12. And this one has only two. One less. So 14 <coughs> phalanges. Make sense? So total 30 bones. Arm bone is what? Humerus. And forearm? Radius and ulna. Lateral is radius, medial is ulna. How many carpals? Short bones? Eight. <coughs> Eight. Two rows, right? And how many metacarpals? Five. How many phalanges? Fourteen. Okay. So these are the bones of your upper limb. Now we'll see the humerus and its parts. Humerus is a long bone. It has two ends, upper end and lower end. Connected by shaft. This is the shaft. So upper end, lower end, connected by what? Shaft. shaft. Now, first we'll see the upper end. Upper end has a head that fits in the glenoid cavity to form the shoulder joint that I have already mentioned a few times, right? The head of the humerus and the <coughs> glenoid cavity forms the shoulder joint. So this is the head. Now see, just around the head, this is just around the head, you have anatomical neck. Okay? Anatomical neck. There is another neck in this bone that is called the surgical neck. But where is that? This one. Where the shaft is attached to the upper end here. This is the what? Surgical, Surgical neck, right? And this is anatomical neck. Is it clear? Then it has two tubercles. Greater is here, the bigger one, and lesser is this smaller one. So greater tubercle and lesser tubercle. So that is the upper end, right? Now, in between those two tubercles, you see, there is a groove. There is a 
group here. That group is in between two tubercles. That's why this groove is called, group is also called sulcus. Same thing, okay? So, since this groove or sulcus is located in between two tubercles, that's why it is called inter tubercular sulcus. Inter tubercular sulcus. This is greater tubercle, this is lesser tubercle, it is in between. Now, why the groove is there? Through this groove, a structure that is the tendon of biceps, you know biceps muscle, biceps bracket, this muscle, the tendon of it passes through it, okay? So, that's the upper end. Then, let's see the shaft. In the middle area of the shaft, or middle of the shaft, there is a rough area that is called deltoid tuberosity. Why it is called deltoid tuberosity? Because you see here, this muscle is called what? Deltoid, okay? This is deltoid muscle. And this muscle goes and gets attached to the middle of the shaft, okay? Here, yeah. ends here. So, lower end goes there, okay? So, that area is rough, and that is called deltoid tuberosity. Now, if you go to the <coughs> lower end, the lower end <coughs> has two structures. Let me get the bone from here. Okay. So, the lower end has two structures. You see here, this is a round structure. This is called capitulum. And this structure is kind of rectangular. This is called troclea. So, capitulum is round and troclea is kind of rectangular. Those two structures. This one articulates with the radius, upper end of the radius. And this one articulates with what? Which is the other bone? Oh. Ulna. Oh. Makes sense? Because radius and ulna are just right below that, right? So radius attached is attached here, ulna is attached to the top here. So two structures. Now at the lower end there are three fossa. Fossa is depression, like this. Okay? So let's see the back first. You see a nice Big fossa here, you see that? In the back of the lower end. This fossa is called olecranon fossa. Why is that? You see here, this is radius, this is ulna. Okay? So, first let me show you. Uh, this is capitula, the round structure, right? Why that structure is round? Because you see the head of the radius has round area, right? So this round fits here. Make sense? So round, round. So capitulum is for what? Radius. Is that clear? It's here. And trochlea. Trochlea is for the ulna. This is called trochlear notch. Is here U shaped trochlear notch? So it is telling you, right? Notch for who? Trochlea, right? So if this is trochlea. So trochlear notch, trochlea. So trochlea will go inside the notch. Make sense? Now you see, this is the way the ulna moves. Now you see, in the back of the humerus, I told you, this is called olecranon fossa, okay? Why? Because this part of ulna is called olecranon process and this is called coronoid process. This is called what? Olecranon process, okay? It's like this, olecranon process. So now you see here, this is olecranon process and this is olecranon fossa, make sense? So when you extend your forearm, what happens? 
this olecranon process enters into the olecranon process. Make sense? So this fossil is for olecranon process. That's why this is olecranon process. Now, this part is called coronoid process, right? So let's see what happens. You see, this is coronoid process. When you flex your forearm completely, what happens? This coronoid process enters into this fossa, this small fossa. That's why that is called coronoid fossa, named after these processes. Go in. And then above the radius, again, going back to radius, above the radius, there is another tiny fossa that is called radial fossa because when you flex your forearm, the head of radius enters into it. So all those three fossa are named after the parts going into it. Make sense? So when you will study, just make sure you think that way. Okay. So this is what? Humerus. How many ends? Two. Upper and lower. Connected by? Shaft. In the upper end, you have a round what? Head. Head. It goes into glenoid cavity of what? Scapula, right? Scapula. To form which joint? Shoulder joint. Is it strong or weak? weak. Because of shallowness of the glenoid cavity, right? Shoulder dislocation occurs. Okay, so this is head, right? Then around the head, anatomical neck. Very good. And the upper end is attached to the shaft here. That area is called what? Surgical, Surgical neck. neck, right? Then you have how many tubercles? Two. Greater and lesser. In between, you have a groove or sulcus. Intertubercular sulcus. Which tendon goes through it? The tendon of? The biceps. Biceps muscle, right? Biceps back. Okay. In the middle of the shaft, you have a rough area that is called what? Delta tuberosity to attach to the delta. Yeah, uh, to uh, 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 this tuberosity is for the attachment of the delta. Delta delta delta. Delta. Then lower end, two structures are what? Round one is called capitulum. Capitulum, okay? For the head of the radius. Very good. Radius, right? Because head is round two. And then you have a kind of rectangular that is called trochlea, right? You have seen the trochlear notch, right? It goes into the trochlear notch. Okay. Then how many fossa it has? Three olecranon, coronoid, and radial fossa. Okay. So this is the bone of your arm. There is a simple test for. Uh, uh, the function to test the function of the shoulder joint that is called Apple's scratch test. This test doesn't need any tools or equipment. So very simple. What you do, you scratch. She is doing that. You are doing that test. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is one position like this. You will reach, okay, to the back of the scapula of the opposite side. Okay. One is. From below, another is from above. Okay. So, uh, if you can reach there and scratch there, that means without difficulty. That means without you know pain. You can reach there and scratch. That means your shoulder joint is good. But if you have restriction, you cannot reach there, or you have painful you know movement to reach there. That means your shoulder has problem. So this is just simple, uh, but a good test for shoulder function. Okay, so you already know shoulder dislocation. <coughs> you know that fracture often occurs at the surgical neck area, right? You already know those two. Now, drop shoulder. Drop shoulder is dislocation of the shoulder here, not the shoulder joint. Which joint is this? You already know. Acromio clavicular joint, right? Acromio clavicular joint. If dislocation occurs here, then what happens? This scapula drops down. 
because this is holding the scapula there. This is the only joint here, right? To hold the scapula. So if that happens, the scapula drops down. So you will see the person's that side is down, lower than the other side. Okay? So that is top shoulder. <coughs> Bones of your forearm, ulna and radius. This is the ulna. I have already shown him. This is the radius. First, we'll see the radius. Okay. This is the head of the radius, and below the head, this area is called what? Below your head, you have what? <laughs> neck, right? So this is the head, and below the head is the neck. Is it clear? And this is a tuberosity Chew. called radial tuberosity. Tuberosity on radius, so radial tuberosity. Make sense? So these three structures <coughs> are operate. Clear? Now we'll see the lower end. You see here at the lower end, a part of the bone is extending further downwards. Extended a little bit further downwards. That extended part is called what? Styloid process. Okay. So this is the styloid process of radius. Same structure you have in alma. That's why we say styloid process of radius, styloid process of alma. Okay. So this is lateral or medial bone of forearm. This side. Lateral, right? That's I mentioned before. Lateral. Okay. So this is the radius. This is what? Ana. Ana looks like you know the upper end of Alna is a kind of open mouth of a snake. Okay. Yeah. It's like this. Okay. And if we think that way, this is the upper jaw, this is the lower jaw, right? And this is in between, the notch, trochlear notch. So this is called olecranon process that I have already mentioned. This is called coronoid process, okay? And you must remember, olecranon process goes to the olecranon fossa, right? And coronoid process goes to the coronoid fossa, here. So, the back olecranon, the front coronoid. So this is coronoid, and this is olecranon, okay? And trochlear notch, clear? At the lower end, you have what? Stellar process of radius or ulna? Ulna, this is ulna, right? Stellar process of ulna. This is the stellar process of radius, clear? Both have stellar process. Now, We'll see how these two bones are attached to each other. The head is attached to this radial notch. You see here, like this. Now, like this. Now, this is one joint between radius and ulna that is called proximal because this end is proximal, this end is distal. You know that, right? This is proximal, this is distal. So this is proximal radio ulnar joint. Most of the cases, joints are named after the bones, right? So this is what? Proximal radio ulnar joint. And this is what? Distal radio ulnar joint. Make sense? So those are the joints. Hold these bones together. And now, in between the shafts, you have a strong connective tissue membrane that is also holding them together. That is called interosseous membrane. You see the picture? Inter, inter means in between, osseous bone in between two bones, that membrane, interosseous membrane. Make sense? So that is a strong connective tissue structure or membrane. <coughs> so by two joints and interosseous membrane, these two bones are held together, attached together. It's difficult to separate. Okay? Interosseous <coughs> member. Okay. Now, if you go to the bones of your hand, hand bones. First, I have already mentioned a few times. How many carpals? Eight. Eight. 
short cubical shape box, right? Short box. Then five metacarpals, 14 calories. Makes sense? So just to know that the lower end of radius, this is the lower end of radius, is attached to two carpal bones, scaphoid and lunate. Only two carpal bones are attached to the lower end of radius, and that is the wrist joint. So wrist joint is formed by lower end of radius and two carpal bones, scaphoid and lunate. You have to remember those two names. Scaphoid and lunate. Okay. Uh, let's move forward. Now we'll talk about the lower extremity. How many pelvic girdle do you have? One or two? One. One. Formed by two yes. pelvic bones or hip bones, right? That I mentioned at the very beginning today. I wrote here. Awesome. Yeah. So, two pelvic bones or hip bones join at pubic symphysis, and that is the pelvic girdle. So, pelvic girdle, pectoral girdle is formed by clavicle. And what? Scapula, right? Right? Pelvic girdle is formed by right hip bone or pelvic bone and left hip bone. Okay? So two hip bones together. Simple. Now, <coughs> Two hip bones and the sacrum, you know this is the sacrum in the back, two hip bones and sacrum together form a structure, this structure that is called the bony pelvis. So two different things, one is called bony pelvis, another is pelvic girdle. So bony pelvis, <coughs> bony pelvis is two hip bones, that means pelvic girdle, and sacrum. Okay. So, make sense? So two hip bones is what? Pelvic girdle, and two hip bones and sacrum? Bony pelvis. Okay, so this whole thing is the bony pelvis, right? because sacrum is here too. So this is a bony pelvis, two hip bones and sacrum. Now, the bony pelvis of a male and female is different. You see here. This is the bony pelvis of a male and this is the bony pelvis of a female. There are few differences. One is, This angle or arch is called pubic angle or pubic arch, which is narrow in male. You see here, this is narrow and wide in female. Now you see the female bony pelvis. You see, it is much wider, right? This is female, this is male. Okay, pubic arch or pubic angle. Just below the pubic symphysis. Another structure is here. You see this area? This is called pelvic brim. I will write it down. This is called what? Pelvic brim. Pelvic brim, which is wider in female. Okay? And pelvic brim is smaller or narrow in male. Make sense? That is number two. Number three, If you see it from the bottom, this area is called outlet, pelvic outlet. Make sense? Outlet. So this outlet is bigger or wider in female and smaller in male. You see here, this is the outlet in male, okay? Outlet in male. This is the outlet 
of female bigger, right? So, why the pelvic outlet is smaller in male? You see the sacrum? Sacrum is more forward, yeah. this way, in male. And backwards in female. Make sense? So, in male it is more forward, that's why that <coughs> outlet is smaller, that area is smaller. In female it is more backward. Right? So that's why the space is more there. Okay? So those are the differences between the male and female bony pelvises. Now, why you see those differences? Because the main purpose is, number one, <coughs> you know that uterus in female is in this area, right? And uterus gets bigger when fetus grows, right, inside. So female needs more room here, make sense? So that's why this area is wider. Another thing is birth, child birth, right? So this outlet should be wider in female, make sense? Then the male for the birth of the child. That's why the sacrum in female is more backwards, to give more room here. Okay? More passes, bigger passes here. Yeah. So that's the main reason why uh, that difference for uh, the fetus to grow and the child birth. Okay, so let me write it down the differences between male and female bony pelvises. bigger in male, smaller or narrow, wider or bigger, then pelvic brim, pelvic brim is small or narrow in male, wider in female and outlet pelvic outlet is what same right bigger or larger in female opening and smaller sorry opposite right outlet is smaller in male and larger in female. So those are the differences. Another you can say that sacrum, right? The sacrum is more forward and sacrum is more backwards. So, those are few differences between male and female bony pelvises. Few days ago, you know, in our library, they got two skeleton. They ordered new skeleton, okay? One male, one female. So, they are very excited. They opened the cover and, uh, you know, to look the skeletons. And after they saw, they, uh, when they uh, were, were going to put, it, put them back, the cover, they could not figure out which one is male, which one is female. So they called me. <laughs> they tried. Yeah. They couldn't. Then they called me. They said, Can you come down? I went there and saw a couple of them were kind of struggling. So uh, it is very simple, right? Easy. If you see here, just uh, you know, pubic angle or pubic arch, you can tell this is male, this is female. Right? We have seen that. So it's not a, a difficult. You can just look and tell this is male, this is female. But if you don't know, then it is a problem, right? 
So you know in the exam. If you know, you can quickly finish. If you don't know, you can sit there, but no help. Nothing helps, right? So it is important that you know the things. So more you will know, you see that things get easier. Much easier, right? Okay. So hip bone. Hip bone has three parts. If you see a hip bone, it has three parts. This is a hip bone. The whole upper portion is called ilium. And the lower back is called ischium. Lower front is called pubis. So lower part is divided into two. Lower back, lower front. Okay. So ilium, ischium, pubis. Make sense? Okay. Now, <coughs> there is a large deep socket that is called acetabulum. Acetabulum is for the head of the femur. This is the femur, okay? And this is the head of the femur. So acetabulum is for what? Head 